would like to get underway um, with our keynote speaker. Um, Linda Tirado, um, I am very welcome, uh, very glad to welcome her here today uh, to Madison. This is the first time she's ever been in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, she is an author, a political commentator, a virtual social worker, a policy analyst, and a mother of two young children. Her own struggle with housing led her to write a book, Hand to Mouth, Living in Bootstrap America, um, which, which unexpectedly launched her into a whole new world um, a whole new reality, which was a vast contract, a contrast from where, what she was experiencing and where she was living, um, leading her to meet new people and situations previously unthinkable, traveling around the world, um, and which she has been doing for the last four years. She has many stories to tell um, and many stories that she's going to share with us today, so I would like to welcome Linda Torado. moment of silence for when the speaker's trying to get up to the podium. Um, I'm going to, full disclosure, I haven't given a speech in about six months, so I'm going to be a little nervy for the first five minutes, and then I'm going to get into it. And to hide my nerves, we're going to do a little bit of interactivity, because I like to know the audience I'm talking to, and I really have no clue who all of you guys are. So raise your hand if you have a college degree. <laughs> okay. Um, raise your hand if you've ever been evicted or have a family member who's ever been evicted, or ever didn't make your rent. Okay, so about half, which means I can skip a whole bunch of this. I have three different speeches I give to folk, and it depends on the first couple of hand raises which way I go with it, because I've found that if I speak to a room full of VCs, it's a very different need for a speech than if I'm speaking to a room full of people who have experienced homelessness or poverty. Um, so like Olivia said, I, my name is Linda Tirado. I, I mostly have been a night cook. I, I've been a waitress. I've been a bartender. I, I've worked in a lot of clubs. Worked at a pig farm for two weeks one time. Couldn't get the smell out of my nose. Quit. <laughs> and then um, a lady online was wrong. And it was very late. And I had an answer. And I'm very wordy, and so everybody thought I'd written an essay when actually it was just a very long, angry internet comment. <laughs> and what she had said was that she had been to a store and seen somebody with an iPhone and a food stamp card. And she was a nice progressive lady, and she wanted somebody to remind her why she shouldn't, as a taxpayer, be angry about that. Yeah. I had, a, I had a couple of replies, because I was actually just coming off of my second shift of the day, and I'd been supposed to go home at 9 p.m., but the closing cook called off, and so then I had to close the restaurant. It was like 2 o'clock in the morning, and I was heavily caffeinated, and I'm trying to come down and get some sleep before my morning shift, and I just stayed up all night telling her that actually poor people are allowed to experience joy, and that you are not allowed to second guess where somebody got an iPhone in a system in a country where a phone comes free with a two-year contract, and where people have uncles and wealthy relatives, and wealth is, is relative, but what I mean is that for all of you who have never been evicted but raised your hand about a family member, I am sure you buy those relatives nice things for their birthday, even if you can't get them out of the situation that they're in. And then um, that went super viral. <laughs> it was a Thanksgiving weekend of 2013, and the Huffington Post had it on the front page for a week. And then it kind of went worldwide. And then they asked me, do I want to write a book? And me not being stupid, I said yes, because they were going to pay me. <laughs> I mean, I appreciate the applause, but they did pay me, so it's fine. <laughs> Um, and then I went on tour, which, uh, let me tell you, if you're a night cook from rural Utah and all of a sudden you're on Madison Avenue, it's a bit of a change. <laughs> um, the thing that really stood out to me during, during the book process, um, they, they took me to New York, right, because I, I, I didn't know how to write a book. <laughs> I'm not actually a writer. Well, I wasn't at the time. I am now. Um, so they brought me to New York, Penguin did, and they got me an editor named Petternell Van Arsdale. <laughs> God love Petternell. If you ever have to write a book in a hurry, hire the woman. She's so worth it. 
Um, but with that sort of name, you can imagine the pedigree that comes along with it. And so I had been um, walking down Fifth Avenue, kind of just staring at everything. And there were these jeans in some shop window that were pre-torn. <laughs> and they were more expensive than the same jeans without holes in them. And so I wrote a, a joke, uh, and the process was I would go home, I would write, I would bring her my stuff the next day, she would go through it and assign me more things to write. That was how the book got done. And I wrote this joke about how I had a solution to the homelessness problem, which was that rich people needed to buy the cheaper jeans and a pair of nail scissors, then just give a homeless guy 10 bucks to go ahead and put the holes in them. And this solves everything for everybody. I mean, everybody plays, everybody wins. So I bring this joke in the next day, and she's reading it, and I realize the woman is wearing those jeans. <laughs> to her credit, she laughed hysterically, and it made it into the book. So um, the world is a bit of a shifting place for me. I don't really fit anywhere anymore. I lecture at the London School of Economics, and I can't get into a college. <laughs> I have a, a system when I give college lectures, and particularly in the Ivy League, um, I go, I give the lecture, and then I apply as an undergraduate. The rejection letters that Harvard sends out are wonderfully snarky. <laughs> like, they actually told me, you might be a better fit somewhere else. We're a very selective institution. I was like, yeah, I know. I was just lecturing your sociology students. Um, I don't have Cornell yet. I'm missing one out of the whole Ivies. Um, the other thing I found out about the Ivy League, which blows my friggin' mind, Harvard and Yale are in a internecine fight over who looks older, which buildings look older. And so they acid wash the outside of their buildings every 10 years in order to age it, in order to create an edifice that looks more storied and institutional than it already is. So I'm giving this lecture to like Yale Law, I think it was. I was talking about how much easier it is to, to learn in beautiful surroundings compared to you know, your hospital green of a community college and the you know, workaday buildings. And you go to this place and it's filled with such beauty and it's so inspiring. And this lady just raises her hand in the middle of the lecture and she goes, ma'am, I'm so sorry, I can't let you keep going without telling you that all of the beauty is fake here. And so then, well, that was the end of my lecture. Then it was a Q&A where I was just asking the students about living at Yale <laughs> for about 30 minutes. It was pretty great. Um, but I wanted to bring that up specifically because so often when we do initiatives and when we do things, we're creating beauty where none existed as a way to make ourselves feel better. Which is to say, if your policies are not being designed by and for the people who are going to have to live them, your policies are not as effective as they could be. So I want to know, how many of you in this room would be impacted by the policies that you're discussing? That's not nearly as many hands. So I want you guys to go through today thinking about that and thinking about the fact that if you design a program for people and you don't understand their lives, you're not going to design the program as effectively. Uh, for example, I was pregnant. Uh, you know, it's, I, can't, I, can't, I can't do podiums very well. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a pacer. Um, so I was uh, pregnant, heavily pregnant, uh, and uh, we had a flood. My entire apartment was ruined. Everything we'd collected for the baby, gone. I was working at Burger King part-time. My husband was working at Burger King part-time. And so we went to a bunch of charities. We said, can you guys help us? And what I wanted more than anything, because I was eight months pregnant and it was May, and any person in this room who's been pregnant will know that feeling, right? Like this baby has to come now. I wanted a chair. I wanted a chair, a comfortable chair to sit on when I got off of work. And so I went to all of these agencies, I went to all of these places and I said, hey, can I have a chair? And I finally found a place that did furnishing for low income folk. They told me, sure, you can have a chair, but you're going to have to attend this resume writing seminar because we want to help people move into work in your situation. I said, I don't need to learn how to write a resume. I'm perfectly capable of writing a resume. What I need is a chair. They said, right, but you're going to have to come to the thing. I said, all right, when's the thing? It's once a month during my shift at work. 
I'm like, okay, so what you're telling me is I need to miss work to come and take a class on how to find a job. And they said, yeah, if you want the chair. And that sort of policy makes a whole lot of sense in a room like this, in a conference like this, when you're thinking, well, how do we help folk, right? People need skills, people need measurable skills. A lot of people do need help writing their resume. But you don't wanna make it a requirement. You wanna make it additional, you wanna make the help available. But if you make it a requirement, you wind up telling pregnant ladies they can't have a chair. And that doesn't help anybody. So, there you go, those are my opening anecdotes, now I'm nice and loose and limber, let's get to the speech. <laughs> I do want you guys to know, by the way, I lecture like it's a college class, there's gonna be a and a at the end, and if none of you raise your hands, I'm gonna start calling on you. <laughs> so, I don't know what language you guys use to describe yourselves. I give a lot of these speeches to a lot of housing coalitions, and most often I hear stakeholders and clients which is weird to me, because how are your clients not the stakeholders, mostly? And why are they clients? This isn't a business. We're not, like, I'm not paying you to help me find a house, except for as a taxpayer. But in that way, everybody that pays taxes is one of your clients, right? So like the commercialization of housing is, is uh, a little odd to me. It hits my ears weird. So I don't know how you guys refer to yourselves, I don't know how you guys refer to other people, um, I don't know how you guys refer to, to anything, but I will say, everybody in this room is in a position to help another human today. Every single one of you. So before the speech, I was talking to this guy named Gary. He was out front, he asked me for a cigarette, we started hanging out. Did any of you guys talk to Gary on the way in? All right, cool, maybe he was gone by the time everybody showed up. Anyway, he's been living on the streets in Madison for about six years now. He has been in and out of housing, he's been in and out of work, and his biggest problem is that when it gets cold, he needs another coat. That's it, I asked him, what is it that you need? I'm about to go walk into a room full of people who are gonna spend their entire day trying to think about how to help you. So what can I tell them? He said he needed a coat. I think he needs a little bit more than that. And I think you guys are in a position to provide it. And so another thing that I want you to be thinking about is what solutions can you provide that people in the situations that I've been in wouldn't know of? Anybody been a cashier, worked at a store, retail? Okay, so you know how like if a customer's super nice, you have like the extra special discount button, or you can tell them that like, oh, if you do it this way, it's cheaper? I need you guys to be thinking about housing like that. What hacks to the system are you guys aware of as experts that I, as somebody looking for housing, wouldn't know? So one of the best programs I've ever seen was Holistic. There was a, a place in Arizona, I wanna say uh, Maricopa Five County Association, something like that, it was a few years ago, I don't remember. But what they did was they made one caseworker for all of the programs instead of having a caseworker for every program and clients having to go back and forth. And that way, they actually reduced the amount that they had to spend because they weren't doubling up with different programs trying to provide the same service. They were able to tailor to their, for their clients what those clients actually needed because one person was in charge of start to finish. Anytime this person had contact with the system, it was the same person. They were able to build a level of trust with their clients because there was just a person to call. I don't, how many of you guys have ever had to apply for welfare? It's hell, right? It's absolute hell. They need all of your taxes, they need all of your receipts, they need your pay stubs. They need to know who's been sleeping in your house and how frequently because they have to make sure that it's not like a wage earner, that you wouldn't qualify as a household. But it has the actual effect of going, who's sleeping with you and how frequently do they stay? Which is pretty dehumanizing. Those sorts of things are made easier if you just call Kathy. I just gotta call John. I just, you know, it's not a question of how many agencies do I have to run around to? How many people do I have to dehumanize myself with? You're allowed to just have a friend helping you. And that is the most innovative solution I have seen 
anywhere in the entire world. Something as simple as, let's just shuffle the way we do our cases, has a huge impact both emotionally on the people that need the services and also on the, the finances of the agencies that are providing them. Salt Lake City, I'm sure you guys all know, solved homelessness. It was very, very famous for a while. They had, uh, they reduced the rate of homelessness by 91% in a single year. Yeah, you know how they did it? They gave people houses. Salt Lake City now has a homeless rate higher than it was when they started because they cut what's called Housing First, which was the program that cured the homelessness problem. They cut all of the money for it, and within a year, they were not only back to where they started, they were worse off. The programs that we build have to be sustainable, and we have to be committed to sustaining them. Any single-year solution is no solution at all. It's a Band-Aid. So whatever it is you guys design, because I'm sure you're all smart, capable people, and after today, you guys are gonna come out of here with like guns blazing, rearing on the horses, ready to solve everything. I need the things that you create here to be sustainable and to have the commitment to see them through. Because otherwise, you're just sort of you know, helping a little bit and helping around the edges. And unfortunately, in this economy, in this country, in this time, in this era, there's not a whole lot of support. People don't want to hear, we need to help people that are poor. People want to hear, just get a job. People want to hear, oh, we're going to, you know, everybody's going to go to college, everybody's going to make good. Well, I'm here to tell you, no, we're not. Every poor person can't get a book deal. I wish. It would be a lot of books. Nobody could read them all. But the fact remains that people say that I'm living the American dream, and if this is the dream, it's a nightmare. Because it shouldn't take a lottery for you to be able to feed your family. It shouldn't take a lightning bolt from the sky. It is so unlikely that I would have ever seen Harvard, much less be lecturing there. This is not a sustainable dream for millions of people to solve all of this, right? So we need to think about how do we de-emphasize the bootstraps? Because the entire point of the bootstraps is you're supposed to lift yourself up, which is levitation. <laughs> it's a terrible metaphor, but we use it all the time, and we blame people for their poverty as though they're not working hard enough, as though bartenders aren't making it in Congress now, right? That, However you feel about politics and however you feel about the parties, the fact that there is a bartender in Congress is unprecedented. Somebody from the working class made it into a place where the average net worth is well over a million dollars. Imagine the policies that we would have if people like me were allowed to design them. So in San Francisco, uh, they're solving homelessness and, and housing insecurity uh, with uh, shipping containers. They're just building them and then bringing them into the city and stacking them right on top of each other like they're apartment complexes. Of course, they're not building them in San Francisco because they can't afford the wages there. So they're building them about 300 miles away with lower wage labor and then bringing them into San Francisco to house low-wage workers in. Which seems almost reasonable on the face of it. But in the background, you've got people doing things like uh, putting out giant landscaping rocks as an anti-homelessness initiative. A group of wealthy folk in San Francisco decided that there were too many people sleeping on the streets since they just put decorative landscaping rock out so that you couldn't sleep there someone with a sense of humor put them up for free on Craigslist. <laughs> About half of them are gone now. I don't know who spent that much money on landscaping rocks, but that was one way you could spend your bonus, I suppose. And you have to think about the fact that this is a city that used to be affordable. 
up until tech moved in. I mean, and I love my phone as much as anybody else, right? Like, I think, pff, you should see my, don't actually look up my Twitter, it's very unprofessional. <laughs> but when people came in to provide solutions to all of humanity, they completely muddled the place they were because they weren't thinking about localities, they weren't thinking about the municipality, they weren't thinking of themselves as citizens of this neighborhood and of this area. They were thinking of themselves as citizens of the world with no corporal needs whatsoever. Apparently they all thought they were like VCs or kind of spiritual beings or something, which actually if you talk to a whole lot of people in Silicon Valley, that's not far from the truth. But when you come and create a problem and you don't solve the problem, that leaves it up to people like you to step in to the breach and figure out how to marry these two things. And I wanted to bring that up specifically to tell you that I understand the impossibility of your task. The poor you will always have with you. You cannot solve for poverty in a capitalist system, in a system that is specifically built on money and property. There will always be poor people. You are fighting a hydra here. And I really love and appreciate the work that you guys are putting into this because it does take a lot to focus your professional lives on helping other people for an unsolvable problem. It's very frustrating to have an unsolvable problem, like not having enough rent money. What are you gonna do? How much can you hustle? We're screwed now, we're getting evicted, right? It is important that you understand that the importance of the work is not the solution that you find, it's that the work is being done and consistently being done. I never minded, um, excuse my language here, I never minded how screwed I was. Like that was, that was just normal. Everybody I knew was in the same boat. I minded that nobody cared. I minded that people blamed me as though I wasn't working three jobs as though I wasn't always looking for more. I mean, you can get it. I actually really loved that. Like, more than once, the cell phone's wrong, and I've picked it up, been like, hey, this is Linda. I'm just giving a, hey, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm just glad it wasn't mine. So, what's business doing? What's the business sector doing? Because, like, people, like, the mayor and the alderman or council person, have talked about you know, what our employer is doing. And I think that's really healthy because I think employers need to be doing more. I think that when you extract the most possible labor out of me and pay me as little as you're legally allowed to, you should have to help me with transportation. You should have to subsidize my housing. You should make your job a livable one because it's a moral imperative. And not only that, it's good for business. You know how much better of an employee I was when I wasn't exhausted, when I wasn't distracted, when I wasn't worried? First time I went to the Huffington Post in Washington, DC, they have a nap room. <laughs> they got a beer bar. They got free snacks. And like, I didn't know that an employer could care about your health and well-being. I didn't know that it was even possible for an employer to know that you needed to sleep sometimes, much less in the office. It absolutely destroyed me. It took me like three weeks. I just walked around telling strangers on the street. I'm like, yo, did you know that Huffington Post has a nap room? <laughs> and then people started telling me about what other people got too. And then I went out to the valley. The first time I lectured, out in Palo Alto. I was at a tech company, which I will not name. They had slides and bean bags to go, like a bean bag pit, like a ball pit, but for grown-ups. Nobody used it because the culture was such that you were supposed to be always working, always on the grind, happy to do 90 hours. But they put the ball pits out so that you had the appearance of fun. Nobody in that workplace was healthy. That was the saddest group of people I've ever, ever, ever talked to in my life. They were almost dead from the exhaustion, from the pressure, from the strain. And so an employer has the responsibility of creating a culture 
that is healthy for their workforce. And creating a healthy workforce culture does not mean putting a damn ball pit in the middle of your office. It means a nap room. And also a beer bar if you're a journalist. It's pretty standard for us. <laughs> so there are... Uh, You guys, you know what? I was about to tell you about a couple of other tech programs, but I'm gonna tell you this instead. When we're thinking about housing, when we're thinking about sustainability, when we're thinking about our clients, when we're thinking about people as, as whole human beings, it doesn't really matter what shortcuts you come up with. There are so many really good programs. There's this program called EVEN that's um, doing a lot of good work. Uh, it helps people that are on low income uh, not get hit when they have a doctor's bill or they miss a day of work. And it's very complicated and there's a lot of algorithms and a lot of fees and it goes back and forth. But the fact remains that it wouldn't be necessary to have those shortcuts. It wouldn't be necessary to have those problems if we got to the root of the actual problem that we have is that we do not respect people as whole human beings. We look at people as workers, as spouses, as parents, as friends, as whatever, and we're not thinking holistically. And I think that if we could get past that, we wouldn't have to paper over. We wouldn't have to find ways to make it workable to hold a job and still pay your rent. Isn't that insane? That there has to be a tech solution so that people who are in work can maintain housing. It seems to me like it might just be easier to pay everybody a little bit more. Maybe put all that money towards like a grant and subsidize some housing. I'm homeless right now, technically. I live in a friend's attic with my family. Um, this is you know, partially because I moved cities and I haven't found a good spot yet. But the reason I haven't found a good spot is that I got evicted. You know how hard it is to get housing with an eviction on your record? You know why I got evicted? Because in that five-year flood, which my landlord created, by the way, because it was a bit of a slum, and he didn't pay the maintenance guys, and so they never snaked out the drains, and then there was a huge summer storm, the drains backed up and caused two feet of water in my house. And then their solution to that was to shop vac and then put two box fans in and leave the windows open for two weeks in Ohio in June. So um, I, being very heavily pregnant and working at Burger King, had to go to a hotel, like a weekly hotel, that was right next to my work. And I couldn't pay both the rent on an apartment I couldn't stay in, plus replace all of my stuff, plus pay the rent on this hotel. So I didn't pay the rent, because I figured if I didn't live there, I didn't have to pay the rent. And he sued me for eviction, and he won. And now I can't find a house. <laughs> Which is weird, because I'm a noted expert on housing. But no landlords care about that. The landlords don't care that I'm gonna get a check for a keynote. They don't care that I'm world famous. They don't care about anything. They care about that eviction, which I later got reversed. I sued him and won. It took me six months to find a lawyer that would take my case because I couldn't afford to pay. The guy finally did just because he, he you know, occasionally you run into somebody who is so outraged by an injustice, they're willing to like actually go to the mat for you, and this guy was. And I couldn't afford to pay him, so after everything happened, um, I came into a little bit of money with the book, I went back and I tried to pay him. And I don't understand legal ethics, but he said he couldn't ethically take the payment or whatever. So I gave him a bunch of money so that he can pay for himself the next time he runs into me or somebody like me. But the fact remains that I'm not ashamed of being homeless now. Like, this isn't my problem. I mean, it's, it's technically my problem, but mm -mm, I ain't taking any of the blame for this. I'm not having trouble finding housing because I'm not in secure employment. I'm not having trouble finding housing because there aren't houses. I'm having trouble finding housing because of the system that we have built, 
which is specifically meant to keep people like me out of stable situations. I can't find a house in a good school district for my kids because we tied school district funding for some reason to property taxes. So any place I can find is gonna be somebody who's gonna take somebody that I, I, I'm technically not employed. I mean, I'm an activist, I make my money, but I don't have a stable job. I don't have an employer to serve as a reference, unless one of you guys wants to do it. <laughs> but I'm not ashamed of it the way I used to be. Because before I started talking, it, it's, it, it's a lot emotionally to talk about money, right? It's a lot to talk about shame. It's a lot to talk about how it makes you feel and what you have to go through. It's a lot to stand up in front of a group of people and say I had failed for most of my life to make anything out of my opportunities, out of my skills, out of my talents. It's unsettling to say the least. But I don't feel ashamed about being homeless right now because this is not my problem. It is the problem of the system that created me. And I, you know, thank God for it because I'm allowed to do this for a living and it's actually not a bad gig to get paid to go new places and meet new people. I had a couple of drinks with a bunch of guys last night down at some really great little pub. I never would have come here and done that on my own, no offense, just wouldn't have had reason to go to Wisconsin. But it's interesting to me that I can come and be an expert on housing and be technically homeless. I slept in a Walmart on my way here. Um, I drove here from Philadelphia, uh, and I took a wrong turn in Ohio. Did not get to Albuquerque, thank God. But I passed a rest stop. I said, okay, that's fine. I'll you know, hit the next one. And then it was 2 o'clock in the morning, and it was raining, and I was swerving. I thought, okay, well, we're going to go to Walmart and just sleep there because they actually, if you didn't know this, Walmart has this really great policy where they want you to come buy stuff, so they'll just let anybody sleep in their lots, in their cars. You just have to alert security that you're there. And me being me, it was very, very cold. So I went and bought a pillow and a blanket because I didn't have that with me. And I kicked out in my car, and about 5 o'clock in the morning, this like wonderful transportation worker knocks my window and tells me my lights are on. I've killed my battery sleeping, because I, I, I don't know how I managed to kick the lights on in my sleep, but I clearly did. And so I had to wait until like 7.30 in the morning, and then the Walmart guy came and, and jumped my in car, and everything was good to go. But I was thinking of the irony of sleeping in a Walmart in the cold on the way to do the housing conference. And then I was thinking how lucky I was that I'd been poor for so long because I knew about the Walmart. And I knew that the Walmart had the battery jumper thing if they had the auto care center, right? I, I would not have known that had I not gone through what I went through. There's not really a point to that story. I just think it's really ironic and I thought it was funny. <laughs> How am I doing on time? Five more? Okay, cool. So, I have five more minutes and then we're gonna start the Q&A. So everybody start. I've only been talking for 15 minutes. 10 more minutes to talk and then we're doing Q&A. 10 more minutes total. Cool, we're doing Q&A, guys. <laughs> I swear I'm gonna start calling on people if I don't see a hand come up. I'll repeat your question, I can hear you. Oh yeah, no, if you get evicted out of government housing, you're screwed. Yeah, uh-uh, nobody's gonna take you after that. Huh, private subsidized housing as well. I also know that if you are living on Section 8 or HUD and you have a family member who committed a crime, they'll evict you for that. They'll tell you that you can't have your son come live with you or even visit because you're not allowed to have criminals in your home. But since we criminalize life if you're low wage, particularly if you're not white. We know the statistics on arrest. We know the statistics on who gets charged with crimes and who gets prosecuted and why and how. 
So essentially, this policy is criminalizing not being white and having a family, which is pretty messed up, actually. Next. Oh, hey, we got a mic now. <laughs> Punk rock. This is like the endless walk here. Um, what would you say is the single most important housing policy to focus on tomorrow? Compassion. How can you make these policies more compassionate? And how can you make them more people focused? By which I mean, when you make a policy, go and find somebody who's going to be impacted by that and have them read it to you and have them tell you what the troubles are gonna be and have them troubleshoot it. Because I'll tell you what, you know what I know, poor people didn't design the chair program. Right. Sure didn't. There was one back there, I think. Oh my, you just popped up out of nowhere with that. Good on you. <laughs> that was amazing. Um, I wanted to hear a little bit about, we talked about transportation and housing and how that's tied. Some of your experiences and challenges of uh, transportation and getting to work and home and that so I once I uh, lost an entire truck over $200 uh, I had parked illegally and not realized it because I was late to work and they ticketed and towed me while I was at work and then I couldn't pay the tow fee until I got paid on Friday so I called the towing company I said all right cool I'm gonna come pick it up on Friday and they said sure no problem and then I showed up on Friday and it wasn't $200 it was $700 because they charged $100 a day to store it so then I said, all right, well, I'll make that up. I'm going to come back in a couple of weeks. Can you guys maybe not charge me as much for the storage fee? And they kind of laughed at me, and so I just left the truck there. Um, and this is out west. We don't have public transit as well. Like, the, the transit systems in the west are not as robust as, as they are in the east. So, you know, like, Chicago's got really robust transit, Philadelphia, D.C., those areas. It doesn't really exist in the country at all and it doesn't exist in Western cities. So the troubles that I've always had with transportation is it's freaking expensive, and it's impossible. And if you don't have a vehicle and you can't pay your insurance, you gotta go on the SR-22. And then if you lose your SR-22 or you're late uh, by a day paying your car insurance, there's a warrant for your arrest in some states, which is insane. <laughs> it's, it, it's nonsensical, it is punitive, and it doesn't do anything to help anybody. Even though I think everybody can agree that it's a net social good that every car on the road is insured, that's not a good way to do it. So my problems with transportation have always been, you know, I, I don't have any, or I can't access it when I needed it. Um, I walk a lot, still. Um, I lived in Chicago for a couple of years, and my friends would make fun of me because I would walk two miles instead of taking the bus or the L. I'm like, well, A, I'm saving myself 250, and B, I used to walk 14 miles to get to work if my car was broke, because that's how far it was, and what are you gonna do, not go to work? And so I'd spend, you know, three or four hours in transit to get to work, work a shift, walk home. It's not uncommon. And you see these heartwarming stories where like somebody will be like, oh, this person that works at Burger King's walking to work, and they'll buy them a car, and we point to it as though it's heartwarming instead of horrifying that that would even be necessary. Anybody else? Yeah, one in the back. Hi. Um, in Wisconsin, local governments um, are pretty limited in our tools we can use to create um, new affordable housing units, and a primary tool relied upon is the low-income housing tax credit program. Um, a problem I see with that is that there, we have high, really high median incomes here in Dane County, and so a lot of um, local subsidy and then low-income tax credits are going to projects that a lot of folks with um, experience of homelessness are just not able to get into, even if they have income because of the barrier that you mentioned, history of eviction or other negative rental history. Um, so do you think it's important that um, when we're um, creating these new units and using the tools we have at our disposal, that we be sure that they, you know, make sure that we can, um, that folks can get into them who have an experience of homelessness, or is it just important to create more units for other folks that don't have as many barriers? 
I think that you need to have a special program for folks that would be barred. Yeah. And it specifically needs to uh, address their barriers yeah. and forgive them. Yeah. I think you need to have a program because look, there's people who are irresponsible, there are people who just had a rough patch, there are people, you know, there's any number of reasons somebody might fall into homelessness, right? And usually it's through a mix of your own decisions and some seriously bad luck. And your decisions are made in this vacuum and, complete, and, and more and more constrained by your situation and then you don't have any good decisions that you could choose and then people ask you why you made the bad ones. You say, well, I had to make a decision and I had bad or worse, so I went with bad, which was actually good. Ta-da! You need to have a program that people can come in and say, hey, I had this happen and I'm stable now so that they're not being barred. Because why are you building low-income housing if people can't get into it if they've got an eviction? Like, what is that even? What's the point of that? How many, how many people in low incomes haven't been late on their rent? Everybody knows what those notices look like. Anybody in a low-income housing building knows what those notices look like. And if you're building housing for people who know what the notices look like but they can't have had one themselves, then what's the point of the program? I'm very confused, actually. <laughs> I, I don't really understand the premise of the question because why would you create that program to begin with? I mean, and yeah, build more houses. Always build more houses, we need more. But I, 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 somebody's gonna actually have to explain that program to me because I don't understand why you would create that. I think I got time for one more. A few more, cool. I, the, the mic guy is going around. I got one in the middle here too. I work at a counseling agency here in Madison and I try to work with about nine to 11 people that are homeless and I've been doing it for three months and I have not found housing for one single person yet. And I meet with them every week and we fill out applications and wait lists, et cetera, et cetera. Do you have anything positive that I can tell them after this uh, uh, wonderful uh, speaking thing that you did today that I can tell them to give them some hope? Tell them I love them. Tell them that I know exactly what that feels like and that it's absolutely fine to feel that way and that the shame is normal and the pain is normal but that the love is the part that you don't get to see when you're awash in the pain and the shame. And tell them that you love them because you. you have been working your ass off for those people and they can see it and they feel it and they know it but tell them anyway. Because the thing that happens is you forget that you're worth anything when people keep telling you how worthless you are. When people keep saying, well, well, let me see your bank account before I decide whether you count as human or not. It, it, it gets in your soul. So tell them I love them. Thank you. You've obviously looked for housing while you've been low income. Can you describe some of the challenges and some of the choices what your choices were and how you decide between better and I mean bad and worse? Yeah, um, you don't have choices. That's it, there, there are none. You just apply everywhere and wherever you can get into, you live there until you can't afford it anymore. And the whole time you're living anywhere, you're always on the move because you're looking for a job that pays you 20 cents more an hour, right? So then if that's across town, you might need to find a place that's across town because you don't have the transportation. So it's, it's basically, um, it's a chase. It's, it's not a choice. There's not, it, it, it's not like I can just go to any condo and be like, oh, I don't like the kitchen in this one. I mean, I was living in a place that they had, for some reason, built a retaining wall in the kitchen and you couldn't open the oven. They charged me $1,500 a month for that place. I didn't have an oven. That was really illegal. But what was I supposed to do? Call the city building code inspectors? I mean, when I called about the mold after the flood, I was living on a dividing line between apparently two different agencies' purviews, and they both told me the other one was in charge, so I never could get a health inspector out, which is how I lost the eviction to begin with, as I had pictures, but I couldn't get it unless I could pay for a private company to come in and do the inspection, then the, I, I couldn't just put pictures in at court. I had to have somebody certify that, in fact, it was unhealthful mold. It wasn't just regular mold. It was really bad. Um, so yeah, I know there's, it's not like it's a search for what you want, it's a search for who will let you live there. Like it's, it, it, I don't know how extremely online all of you are, but it's Philip Fry, shut up and take my money. 
where you're just like, I, ju I just want to give you the money. Can you please take my money? And the answer is no. Your money isn't good enough here. Um, and so you just keep going until you find somebody that wants the money more than they want to tell you how worthless you are. That's basically it. I wish I had something better, but <laughs> there, it's not, it's not, one thing I've found since I've been working amongst middle and upper class people is that there are these like normal steps people take. Like when you're gonna get an apartment, you check your credit maybe, and you start looking around and you start looking at, you know, talking to your friends and who's got what. None of that exists for us. Like we just, we don't have those steps. We don't live that exact, we don't live that kind of life. Um, everything about being poor is trying to solve the next minute problem. In the original long comment essay that I wrote, I, I talked about how poor people don't plan for the long term because it would be maladaptive. It would be maladaptive for me to live a life of poverty with upper class norms or uh, upper class reasoning. Because if you can't pay your rent, you're not worried about your retirement. That's a long way away and you gotta live to see retirement first. So I, a lot of the ways that we go about things, and I mean we as low-income folk, um, seem haphazard and they seem unplanned because they are, but that's because we live lives that don't afford us the opportunity to plan. So that is part of what this programming is about, is how do we create paths so that people can make sustainable plans for themselves and their families. Like that's the barrier. I've got up here, I've got, oh, he's got a mic. Um, thank you. Thanks for sharing your story. I appreciate the fact that it's not easy. I, um, That's why I pace. <laughs> fair, right. Um, I'm not one of those people that raised my hand when asked if I'd ever been evicted. I'm not one of those people that raised my hand when asked if I'd ever apply for welfare. That said, I, I believe um, that generally, I personally and most of us are in one of two states. We're either suffering on some level or we're in a beautiful state. And I know from my personal experience that when I'm in that beautiful state, I'm connected. I share love, etc. So my question, I share that background with you because my question is related specifically to your topic. Um, I was in San Francisco for 10 years, 96 to 2006. And um, I saw that tech tsunami hit. I saw the culture, the community, the neighborhoods um, divide, separate, dissolve. Um, and again, I was on one side of that, right? And kind of observing it and just taking it in. I moved here. I've been here now for closer to 13 years. Um, I'm seeing it happen here. And I've recently been involved in a project that um, had a affordable housing component. And I, I, I've learned a lot. I'm continuing to learn a lot. Um, my experience tells me this is a really critical topic. In fact, there's 555 people here today versus five years ago there were 80. Mm -hmm. I think that's telling. Um, in that project, um, I'm learning that terms like affordable housing are loose. Terms like workforce housing are loose. Mm -hmm. We need to get to it. What does that really mean? Is it 50% AMI? Is it 60% AMI? Is it 80% is it, AMI? Is that your question? Nope. Okay. Hold on. Um, my question is, in that project, we were proposing, I'll say, 75 units of 60% AMI affordable housing um, in the downtown urban core. And one of the, and we were proposing that project um, to be on uh, in a part of a big tower. Okay. Three floors of a big tower, not the top floors of the big tower, call it middle floors of the big tower. And there was a lot of resistance to that because the units were all grouped together and not dispersed throughout the tower. 
So what's and the question? The question is, what's more important from your perspective? Because your perspective is one boots on the ground. and Between which and which? What would be better from your perspective? Provide affordable housing that's dispersed? Or? Or together, group together. Oh, yeah, no. OK, look, here's well, the thing. If you put and, us and in a if silo. You, if you, let me finish this one quick, quick, quick point of that. that. If, if there's... I got about one minute left. OK. What's more important? This is, really gets to it, I think. What's more important, the number or quantity of units in an environment like this, like Madison, or dispersing units in a scenario like that? So 20 units, as an example, dispersed throughout a tower in a downtown? Or in a or block together? Or 75 com grouped together? No, that's, I, I, I dispute the premise of the question, because you don't have to pick between those two things. It's just not. The question that you didn't ask that I would have liked to have heard, given the background, was why are we segregating people? Why are we siloing people? It's better if everybody lives together, if everybody lives near each other, because the reason you saw that happen in San Francisco and the reason you're seeing it happen in Madison, the reason it happens all over, is people go, I'm not like them. I'm yeah. better than them. Yeah. And they're allowed to do that because they never talk to us. Yeah. They don't ever know us as people. Okay. So the solution is to not treat us as though we're second class citizens just because we ain't got as money, much money as everybody else does. Because you know what? Ain't nobody works harder than somebody in retail or food service. It's not about value or worth. <laughs> and with that, guys, it's time. So I would like you all to take out your pens. I'm going to give you my email address. Because I talk about money and shame, and a lot of people have questions they don't want to ask in a room full of people. My address is lindawtorado at gmail. Um, I'll be around all day. I'm apparently presenting later, uh, which is good. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for your time. Have a great conference. I have every faith that you guys are going to go out and solve the world problem. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, I'm sure um, we could have stayed here for a while and asked questions, but Linda will be here throughout the day, so please feel free to find her um, and uh, ask her questions, spend time with her. Um, she is more than willing to help and has a lot of great ideas. Um, yeah.